Welcome to the Insightful Professor. In this video, we'll continue our examination of denial of service attacks. We'll be addressing some specific attacks, such as SIN flooding attacks and SIN spoofing attacks. We'll also talk about distributed denial of service attacks, HTTP based attacks, and more. Along the way, we'll also address some defenses against denial of service attacks. Let's take a closer look at the SYN spoofing attack. In this attack, the attacker generates several SYN connection request packets with forged source addresses. The server then responds by recording details of each TCP connection request and sends a SYNAC packet to the claimed source address. If there is a valid system at this address, that system will respond with an RST packet. This is a reset packet. The purpose of this is to cancel the unknown connection request. When the server receives this packet, it cancels the connection request and removes the saved information. However, if the system is too busy or there is no system at the forged address, then no reply will return. In these cases, the server will resend the SYN ACT packet a number of times before finally assuming the connection request has failed and deleting the information saved concerning that connection request. In the time between the receipt of the original SYN packet and the time the server assumes the request has failed, the server is using an entry in its table of known TCP connections. This table is typically sized on the assumption that most connection requests quickly succeed and that a reasonable number of requests may be handled simultaneously. In a SYN spoofing attack, the attacker directs a very large number of forged connection requests at the targeted table. These rapidly fill the table of known TCP connections on the server. Once the table is full, any future requests, including legitimate requests from other users, will be rejected. The table entries will time out and be removed, which in normal network usage corrects temporary overflow problems. If the attacker keeps a sufficient volume of forged requests flowing, this table will be constantly full and the server will be effectively cut off from the internet, unable to respond to most legitimate connection requests. In order to increase the usage of the known TCP connections table, the attacker will use addresses that will not respond to the SYNAC with a reset request. This can be done by overloading the host that owns the chosen spoofed source address, or by simply using a wide range of random addresses. In this case, the attacker relies on the fact that there are many unused addresses on the internet. Flooding attacks take a variety of forms based on which network protocol is being used to implement the attack. In all cases, the intent is generally to overload the network capacity on some link to the server. The attack may alternatively aim to overload the server's ability to handle and respond to this traffic. These attacks flood the network link to the server with a torrent of malicious packets competing with and usually overwhelming valid traffic flowing to the server. In response to the congestion this causes in some routers on the path to the targeted server, many packets will be dropped. Valid traffic then has a low probability of surviving discard caused by this flood. This results in the server's ability to respond to network connection requests being either severely degraded or failing entirely. Note that virtually any type 
of network packet can be used in a flooding attack. It only needs to be of a type permitted to flow over the links toward the targeted system so that it can consume available capacity on some link to the target server. Common flooding attacks use any of the ICMP, UDP, or TCP SYN packet types. Let's now take a closer look at SYN flooding. Many of the most common network attacks, including the popular SYN flood attack, exploit vulnerabilities in TCP connection management. Recall the three-way handshake for TCP that we discussed earlier. Here the server allocates and initializes the connection variables and buffers in response to a received SYN, a connection request. The server then sends a SYN act, an acknowledgement, and waits for the final acknowledgement from the client. If the client does not send an acknowledgement to complete the handshake, the server retransmits the request. So when a segment is sent, a retransmission timer is started. If the segment is acknowledged before the timer expires, the timer is stopped. However, if the timer goes off prior to the acknowledgement coming back, the segment will be retransmitted and the timer is started once again. The server also allocates the buffers and variables prior to completing the third step, receiving the client acknowledgement. So the server eventually terminates the half-open connection and reclaims the allocated resources. But this will be only after a few retransmissions. So in a SYN flood attack, many TCP SYN segments are sent to the target and the third handshake is not completed. A vulnerability with implementing the three-way handshake is that the listening process, the server, must remember its sequence number as soon as it responds with its own SYN segment. This means that a malicious sender can tie up resources on a host by sending a stream of SYN segments and never following through to complete the connection. This attack is called the SYN flood, and it actually crippled many web servers in the 1990s. However, there is an effective defense that can be deployed and has been deployed in most major operating systems. In the three-way handshake, the listening process must remember its sequence number as soon as it responds with its own SYN segment. Instead of remembering the sequence number, a host can choose a cryptographically generated sequence number and put it on the outgoing segment and then does not need to remember it. If the three-way handshake completes, this sequence number, plus one, is the value that will be returned to the host. When the server receives a SYN segment, it does not know if the segment is coming from a legitimate user or is part of a SYN flood attack. So instead of creating a half-open connection for this SYN, which we know results in overhead on the server, the server creates an initial TCP sequence number that is a complicated function, a hash function, of source and destination IP addresses and port numbers of the SYN segment, as well as a secret number only known to the server. This carefully crafted initial sequence number is the so-called cookie. The server then sends the client a SYNACT packet with this special initial sequence number. Importantly, note that the server does not remember the cookie or any other state information corresponding to the SYN. The correct sequence number can be regenerated 
by running the same cryptographic function, as long as the inputs to that function are known. This procedure allows the host to check that an acknowledged sequence number is correct without having to remember the sequence number separately. If the result of the function plus one is the same as the acknowledgement or cookie value in the client's SYNAC, the server concludes that the acknowledgement responds to an earlier connection request, a SYN segment, and is hence valid. The server then creates a fully open connection along with a socket. One of the earlier significant developments in denial of service attack tools was the use of multiple systems to generate attacks. Large collections of such systems under the control of one attacker can be created, collectively forming a botnet, as we discussed earlier. Such networks of compromised systems are a favorite tool of attackers and can be used for a variety of purposes, including distributed denial of service attacks. The attacker often uses a flaw in an operating system or in a common application to gain access and then installs their program, the zombie. This is the attack agent under the control of the attacker. Large collections of such systems under the control of a single attacker can be created forming the botnet. In fact, there's evidence that 40% of distributed denial of service attacks in the year 2015 were from botnets for hire. So how do we deal with this? Well, the best defense against being an unwitting participant in a distributed denial of service attack is to prevent your system from being compromised. This requires good system security practices and keeping the operating system and application on such systems current and patched. Once agent software has been uploaded to a newly compromised system, it can contact handlers to notify of its availability. This is how an attacker can automatically grow suitable botnets. An attacker tends to employ a control hierarchy. There are a small number of systems that act as handlers that control a larger number of systems, agent systems. An attacker can send a single command to a handler, which then automatically forwards that command to all of the agents under its control. Automated infection tools can be used to scan for and compromise suitable zombie systems. This figure illustrates the idea of that control hierarchy to which we referred. One of the earliest distributed denial of service tools is Tribe Flood Network, or TFN, written by the hacker known as Mixter. The original variant from the 1990s exploited Sun Solaris systems. It was later rewritten as Tribe Flood Network 2000, TFN 2K, and could run on Unix, Solaris, and Windows NT systems. TFN 2K has some features that make detection more difficult than its predecessor, including sending decoy information to avoid being traced. Experts at using TFN2K can use the resources of a number of agents to coordinate an attack against one or more targets. Additionally, TFN and TFN2K can perform various attacks, such as UDP flood attacks, ICMP flood attacks, and TCP SYN flood attacks. TFN2K works on two fronts. First, there is a command-driven client on the master system. Second, there is a daemon process operating on an agent system. 
the, the attack works like this. The master instructs its agents to attack a list of designated targets. The agents then respond by flooding the targets with a barrage of packets. Multiple agents, coordinated by the master, can work together during the attack to disrupt access to the target. Additionally, there are a number of safety features for the attacker that significantly complicate development of effective and efficient countermeasures for TFN2K. Master to agent communications are encrypted and may be mixed with any number of decoy packets. Both master to agent communications and the attacks themselves can be sent via randomized TCP, UDP, and ICMP packets. The master can also falsify its IP address, spoofing. Here we discuss two approaches to exploiting hypertext transfer protocol, or HTTP, to deny service. As an example, an HTTP request to download a large file from the target causes the web server to read the file from disk, store it in memory, convert it to a packet stream, and then transmit these packets. The process consumes memory, processing, and transmission resources. An unusual form of HTTP-based attack is something called Slowlaris. Slowlaris exploits a common server technique of using multiple threads to support multiple requests to the same server application. It attempts to monopolize all available request handling threads on the server by sending HTTP requests that never complete. Each request consumes a thread, so the attack eventually consumes all the web server's connection capability, effectively denying access to legitimate users. HTTP protocol specification states that a blank line must be used to indicate the end of the request headers and beginning of the payload, if there is any. Once the entire request is received, the web server may then respond. Slowloris operates by establishing multiple connections to the web server. On each connection, it sends an incomplete request without the terminating new line sequence. The attacker sends additional header lines periodically to keep the connection alive, but never sends the terminating sequence. The web server keeps the connection open, expecting more information to complete the request. As the attack continues, the volume of long-standing Slowlaris connections increases eventually consuming all available web server connections, rendering the web server unable to respond to legitimate requests. Slowlaris is different from typical denials of service in that Slowlaris traffic utilizes legitimate HTTP traffic and does not rely on using special bad HTTP requests that exploit bugs in specific HTTP servers. Because of this, existing intrusion detection and intrusion prevention solutions that rely on signatures to detect attacks will generally not recognize Slowloris. This means that Slowloris is capable of being effective even when standard enterprise-grade intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems are in place. There are, however, a number of countermeasures that can be taken against Slowloris type attacks, including limiting the rate of incoming connections from a particular host varying the timeout on connections as a function of the number of connections, and delayed binding. 
delayed binding is performed by load balancing software. In essence, the load balancer performs an HTTP request header completeness check, which means that the HTTP request will not be sent to the appropriate web server until the final two carriage return and line feeds are sent by the client. This is the key bit of information. Basically, delaying binding ensures that the web server or proxy will never see any of the incomplete requests being sent out by Slowlaris. In contrast to distributed denial of service attacks, where the intermediaries are compromised systems running the attacker's programs, reflector and amplifier attacks use network systems functioning normally. The attacker sends a network packet with a spoofed source address to a service running on some network server. The server responds to this packet, sending it to the spoofed source address that belongs to the actual target victim. This behavior reflects the attack off the intermediary, which is termed the reflector. If the attacker sends a number of requests to a number of servers, all with the same spoofed source address, the resulting flood of responses can overwhelm the target's network link. The fact that normal server systems are being used as intermediaries and that their handling of the packets is entirely conventional means these attacks can be easier to deploy and harder to trace back to the actual attacker. The goal is to generate enough volume of packet to flood the link to the target system without alerting the reflector or the intermediary. There are two basic variants of this type of attack, the simple reflection attack and the amplification attack. The basic defense against these attacks is blocking the spoofed source packet. A further variation of the reflector attack establishes a self-contained loop between the intermediary and the target system. Both systems act as reflectors. In the upper part of this figure, we see normal DNS or domain name system operation. The DNS client sends a query from its UDP port 1792 to the server's DNS port, port 53. The purpose is to obtain the IP address of a domain name. The DNS server sends a UDP response packet including the IP address. Now in the lower part of the figure we see a reflection attack using DNS. The attacker sends a query to the DNS server with a spoofed IP source address of j.k.l.m. This is the IP address of the target. The attacker here uses port 7, which is usually associated with Echo, a reflector service. The DNS server sends a response to the victim of the attack, jklm addressed to port 7. If the victim is offering the echo service, it may create a packet that echoes the received data back to the DNS server. This can cause a loop between the DNS server and the victim, if the DNS server responds to the packet sent by the victim. Most reflector attacks can be prevented through network-based and host-based firewall rule sets that reject suspicious combinations of source and destination packets. While very effective if possible, this type of attack is fairly easy to filter because the combinations of service ports used should never occur in normal network operation.
Amplification attacks are a variant of reflector attacks and involve sending a packet with a spoofed source address for the target system to intermediaries. They differ in generating multiple response packets for each original packet sent. This can be achieved by directing the original request to a broadcast address for some network. As a result, all hosts on that network can potentially respond to the request, generating a flood of responses. It's only necessary to use a service handled by large numbers of hosts on the intermediate network. A ping flood using ICMP echo request packets was a common choice since this service is a fundamental component of TCP IP implementations and was often allowed into networks. The well-known Smurf denial of service program used this mechanism and was widely popular for some time. Another possibility though is to use a suitable UDP service such as the Echo service. The Fraggle program implemented this variant. TCP services cannot be used in this type of attack because they are connection oriented. They cannot be directed at a broadcast address. Broadcasts are inherently connectionless. Best additional defense against this form of attack is to not allow directed broadcasts to be routed into a network from outside. If this form of filtering is in place, these attacks cannot succeed. Another defense is to limit network services like Echo and Ping from being accessed from outside an organization. This restricts which services could be used in these attacks at a cost in ease of analyzing some legitimate network problems. Attackers scan the internet looking for well-connected networks that allow directed broadcasts and that implement suitable services attackers can reflect off. These lists are traded and used to implement such attacks. Let's take a look at the Smurf attack that we mentioned. A Smurf attack involves three systems the attacker, the intermediary, and the victim. An ICMP packet is sent out to the broadcast address of the network. Because it's a broadcast, it responds by echoing the packet out to the network hosts, who then send it to the spoofed source address. All machines then respond to the target. Note that the spoofed source address can be anywhere on the internet, not just on the local subnet. If the hacker is able to continually send packets, this will cause the network itself to perform denial of service attack on one or more of its member servers. The only problem for the hacker is getting the packet started on the target network. This task can be accomplished via some software, such as a virus or Trojan horse, that will begin sending the packets. In addition to reflection attacks discussed previously, a further variation of an amplification attack uses packets directed at a legitimate DNS server as the intermediary system. Attackers achieve attack amplification by exploiting the behavior of the DNS protocol to convert a small request into a much larger response. This contrasts with the original amplifier attacks, which use responses from multiple systems to a single request to gain amplification. Using the classic DNS protocol, a 60-byte UDP request packet can easily result in a 512-byte UDP response, the maximum traditionally allowed. All that is needed 
is a server name with DNS records large enough for this to occur. There are a few steps that can be taken both to limit the consequences of being the target of a denial of service attack and to limit the chance of a system being compromised and subsequently used to launch a denial of service attack. But it's important to recognize that these attacks cannot be prevented entirely. Should an attacker be able to direct a large volume of legitimate traffic to a system, it's possible that this traffic may prove to be too much for the system's network connection. The result is that legitimate traffic requests from other users will be limited. You should be aware that this sometimes occurs by accident as a result of high publicity about a specific site. A posting to the well-known Slashdot News aggregation site often results in overload of the reference server system when popular sporting events uh, like the Olympics or uh, soccer's World Cup matches occur. Sites reporting on them experience very high traffic levels. This has led to the terms slash dotted, flash crowd, or flash event being used to describe such occurrences. There's very little that can be done to prevent this type of either accidental or deliberate overload without also compromising network performance. The provision of significant excess network bandwidth and replicated distributed servers is the usual response, particularly when the overload is anticipated. This is regularly done for popular sporting sites. However, this response does have a significant implementation cost. So what are the possible steps or actions we could take against denial of service attacks. There's attack prevention and preemption. This occurs before the attack. These mechanisms enable the victim to endure attack attempts without denying service to legitimate clients. Techniques include enforcing policies for resource consumption and providing backup resources available on demand. In addition, prevention mechanisms modify systems and protocols on the Internet to reduce the possibility of distributed denial-of-service attacks. Attack detection and filtering applies during the attack. These mechanisms attempt to detect the attack as it begins and respond immediately. This minimizes the impact of the attack on the target. Detection involves looking for suspicious patterns of behavior. Response involves filtering out packets likely to be part of the attack. Attack source traceback and identification applies during and after the attack. This is an attempt to identify the source of the attack as a first step in preventing future attacks. However, this method typically does not yield results fast enough, if at all, to mitigate an ongoing attack. And finally, attack reaction, which applies after the attack. This is an attempt to eliminate or curtail the effects of an attack. A critical component of many denial-of-service attacks is the use of spoofed source addresses, as we've noted several times already. These either obscure the originating system of direct or distributed denial of service attacks or are used to direct reflected or amplified traffic to the target system. One of the fundamental and longest standing recommendations for defense against these attacks is to limit the ability of systems to send packets with spoofed source addresses. This recommendation appears in a request for comments, number 2827. In addition, this recommendation is echoed by other organizations concerned with network security, like SANS and CERT. 
So what we see from the recommendation is that we should block spoofed source addresses. We can do this by applying filters on routers as close to the source as possible. Filters may also be used to ensure that the path back to the claimed source address is the one being used by the current packet. Filters must be applied to traffic before it leaves the ISP's network or at the point of entry to the network. Possible to specifically defend against the SIN spoofing attack by using a modified version of the TCP connection handling code. Instead of saving the connection details on the server, critical information about the requested connection is cryptographically encoded in a cookie. We've discussed this point already. Alternatively, the system's TCP IP network code can be modified to selectively drop an entry for an incomplete connection from the TCP connections table when it overflows, allowing a new connection attempt to proceed. This is known as selective drop or random drop. On the assumption that the majority of the entries in an overflowing table result from the attack, it is more likely that the dropped entry will correspond to an attack packet. Hence, its removal will have no consequence. If not, then a legitimate connection attempt will fail and will have to retry. However, this approach does give new connection attempts a chance of succeeding rather than being dropped immediately when the table overflows. The best defense against broadcast amplification attacks is to block the use of IP-directed broadcasts. This can be done either by the ISP or by any organization whose systems could be used as an intermediary. Limiting or blocking traffic to suspicious services or combinations of source and destination ports can restrict the types of reflection attacks that can be used against an organization. Defending against attacks on application resources generally requires modification to the applications targeted, such as web servers. Defenses may involve attempts to identify legitimate, generally human-initiated interactions from automated denial-of-service attacks. These often take the form of a graphical puzzle, a CAPTCHA, which is easy for most humans to solve, but difficult to automate. Beyond these general defenses against denial-of-service attack mechanisms, overall good system security practices should be maintained. The aim is to ensure that systems are not compromised and used as zombie systems. Suitable configuration and monitoring of high-performance, well-connected servers is also needed to help ensure that they don't contribute to the problem as potential intermediary servers. If an organization is independent on network services, it should consider mirroring or replicating these servers over multiple sites with multiple network connections. This is a good general practice for high performance servers and provides greater levels of reliability and fault tolerance in general, and not just a response to these types of attacks. To respond successfully to a denial of service attack, a good incident response plan is needed. This plan must include details of how to contact technical personnel for the internet service provider or providers. The contact must be possible using non-network means, since when under attack, the network connection may well not be usable. Denial of service attacks, particularly flooding attacks, can only be filtered upstream of your network connection. The division of responsibility between organizational personnel and the ISP will depend on the resources available and technical capabilities of the organization. Within an organization, you should have implemented the standard anti-spoofing, directed broadcast, and rate-limiting filters. 
Ideally, there should also be some form of automated network monitoring and intrusion detection system running so personnel will be notified should abnormal traffic be detected. When a DOS attack is detected, you should first identify the type of attack and the best approach to defend against it. Typically, this involves capturing packets flowing into the organization and analyzing them, looking for common attack types. The organization may also wish to ask its ISP to trace the flow of packets back in an attempt to identify their source. However, if spoofed source addresses are used, this can be difficult and time consuming. Whether this is attempted may well depend on whether the organization intends to report the attack to the relevant law enforcement agencies. In such a case, additional evidence must be collected and actions documented to support any subsequent legal action. In the case of an extended concerted flooding attack from many distributed or reflected systems, it may not be possible to successfully filter enough of the attack packets to restore network connectivity. In such cases, the organization needs a contingency strategy either to switch to alternate backup servers or to rapidly commission new servers at a new site with new addresses in order to restore service. And following immediate response to this specific type of attack, an organization's incident response policy may specify further steps taken to respond to contingencies. This should certainly include analyzing the attack and response in order to gain benefit from the experience and to improve future handling. Ideally, the organization's security can be improved as a result. So what have we discussed across these two videos. We've introduced denial of service attacks, and we've talked about a variety of forms and characteristics that these attacks exhibit. We talked in particular about flooding attacks and talked in some detail about the TCP SIN flood. We also introduced defenses against denial of service attacks, and we suggested how to respond to a denial of service attack. We also looked at reflector and amplifier attacks in a bit of detail. So hopefully you found this to be useful and informative information. And if you have any comments, uh, we welcome those and we'll take a look at them. And once again, thanks for watching.